it's possible that if you check the correlation between particle masses, their stability, and and how long they actually last, that is the correlation between their mass and their decay time, you can see that the, the heavier a particle, the shorter its decay time. So if you think of it from since particles are resonances of fields, resonance points within fields, then for long-lived particles like the electron, you're talking about a particular field. But you have three generations of particles. So the first generation is the up and down quark, the electron, and the electron neutrino. So you can imagine that these are vibrations of a particular coordinate axis. And they're long-lived because that axis vibrates forever. It vibrates along the axis and it vibrates with itself, in resonance with itself. So two types of vibrations. It vibrates along itself, that is along the axis itself. And then it has vibratory overtones of the axis itself, an infinite number of vibratory overtones of the axis itself. So these vibrations basically just last forever. Then the second generation of particles, where you have the strange quark, the charm quark, the muon, and then the moon neutrino. That's really what it is. The mu neutrino. Now these are not long-lived per se. They have lifetimes. The moment they're formed, they decay into simpler because the ground state appears to be the one that is vibrating infinitely often along itself and, and its overtones, its axial overtones. So that's the ground state. Any state above that is unstable. And as long as the ground state is available, the particles decay into that ground state. Okay, so their decay lifetimes represent how long it takes for the decay for that second generation to fall back into the first generation where it is most stable. Now, the third generation is where you have the colossus of the top quark, the bottom quark, and the tau and the tau neutrino. Now, this represents a different type of scaling from the type of scaling in, in terms of mass scaling from the type that we saw in the, or we have seen in the first generation and the second generation so there's something wrong there's something about this particular axis and in my ebook the five principles of organized complexity what i did was to represent because to represent this axis as the expanding part of my model because you have to you have to uh, understand that when you look at numbers natural numbers and their powers the way that they expand for instance the difference between 2 and 2 raised to power 2 2 raised to power 3 2 raised to power 4 2 raised to power 5 etc etc to infinity the difference between 3 raised to power 1 power 2 power 3 power 4 across all the natural numbers you know you get to 10 raised to power 2 power 3 power 4 the, the way these differences are growing between the differences between the powers of all the natural numbers, they're scaling just like the top quark scales compared to the mass of the electrons. So, because this, normally when people think of this powers, this space in which these powers live, you tend to think of them as a flat plane because you can draw a graph where you can actually try to represent them, but they're not a flat plane. Natural, num they're three di natural numbers are three-dimensional. That's the only reason why we have a three-dimensional universe. The prime distribution is three-dimensional, so it prescribes space so and all the properties of space. But this model is not just a three-dimensional whatever. It's the, the three coordinate axes are very different from each other. They are echoes of each other, but they sort of have this difference. And this is highlighted in the way that the this particular axis scales, because it is the axis that scales according to the prime powers, according to the natural number powers or the prime powers. The other two coordinates, they scale according to, one scales according to natural numbers, just one, two, three, four, five. That's the multiplication of natural numbers. And the last one scales according to, I don't know how, how do you describe it? The other one scales, but it's, a, it's, a, it's not, it's like slightly above the multiplications, the natural number multiplications. So you basically have three coordinate dimensions and you and type of scaling that is taking the a type of measure measuring measurement of space that is taking place within that three dimensional space. That's where all the the you know the that's where all the, the meat is, you know, the, the real potatoes of the whole matter. And that's why the non-trivial zeros of Riemann zeta function, that's why they scale the way they do. They are basically describing this space. And you look at the mass of the top quark at 170 something GeV. And you look at the mass of the electron at 500, uh, yeah, 5 MeV or something like, or 0. 
this is 0.5 MeV or 0.501 MeV you can see it's very very small compared to the I mean the difference between an MeV and a GeV is a bit I think it's is, is a is a million right or a billion okay. so that's really what it is compared to the and the electron is very stable you know there's no hint anywhere that it decays into something simpler it is a fundamental particle on its own now the top quark is colossal compared to this and it represents what would happen to an electron for instance if you scaled it according to those the powers of natural numbers all the way to infinity so it, it of course it can't go to infinity because it's it has to simulate a material existence so there's a limit on its on how that growth can occur so there is a cutoff and the cutoff is only sensible it will probably happen uh, something along the multiple of six it doesn't matter where it cuts off that's not the point the point is even if it never cuts off the image of that scaling is a fractal so that it doesn't matter at what energy level you cut it off however you look at it the scaling is always the same the proportionality of the scaling is always the same that's the thing the thing about the space this the, this space and that's why you have in the non-trivial zeros you have this one half as a constant that's Riemann hyp Riemann's hypothesis says that this thing is half meaning it's a that half is a growth rate meaning it's an expansion rate of some kind and that's the expansion that is built right there into the distribution of prime numbers into the the space that think that holds the logic of natural numbers to 3d space and so it is built and you know if you want to measure a 3d space you have to understand you can fix two coordinate systems and then based by virtue of the three, two coordinate systems you can resolve those two coordinate systems into a third dimension you can find the resultant of those two vectors that are that are basically coordinate systems that you can res you can find their resolvent that resolvent becomes a third dimension now it's not like the other two because it's a resolvent so it has properties that are unique and it is that process that is the manifestation of a physical universe a 3d universe so it's apparent in a sense but underlying it it all it comes from 0d zero dimensions and then it comes to one dimension and then two dimensions and then three dimensions it is when it translates itself into a three-dimensional structure as to mimic what it truly is that you have something that looks like a big bang that big bang is basically just emergence into it is the announcement into three-dimensional density and so what i'm saying in effect is that these things which we call fundamental particles they're really just invariants of this number structure this infinite number struct three-dimensional structure and if that is the case then there is a very strong relationship between the non-trivial zeros of Riemann zeta function and the masses of these fundamental particles and the number six in fact there is a, a formula I think it's called Coide formula or is it Coide or something that's right the Coide formula it's an empirical relationship that was discovered by Yoshio Koide in 1981 and it basically draws an empirical relationship between three masses the electron mass the muon mass and the tau mass and what it does is it adds the mass of these three particles and divides it by the sum of the by the sum of their roots squared so basically it's the electron mass plus the muon mass plus the tau mass divided by the sum of these three masses again but the sum of their square roots squared and the it, it yields a curious value which is 0 0.666666 all the way to you know you can which is approximately two-thirds and it is not understood why this relationship exists but the relationship is a geometrical relationship because where the, ma the masses are not random they come from the properties of these this three-dimensional space i have described that is bounded by these three special types of coordinates which are responsible for the entire threeness everywhere you know three generations of fundamental particles you know three charges in terms of electric charge you have the we're not going to count zero because zero is basically no charge but you have the the charge of the d the down quark the strange quark and the bottom quark which is minus one third then you have the it's a fractional charge then you have the fractional charge of the up quark the charm quark and the top quark which is positive two thirds 
then you have the charge of the electron, the muon, and the tau, which is negative one. Now you have to understand that the idea of negative or positive in terms of really with relative to these charges is just nomenclature. It's just it's just a formalism. You can as well switch switch all the charges together and maintain consistency all along, all going forward. You get the same values, just pointing in a different direction. So the absolute value of these charges one third, two third, and one, and that one is three over three. It's not just one because it's one. It's three over three. So you're looking at a some type of matrix. The same thing applies to the to QCD to the color charge. Because the reason why you have eight gluons is because it's two raised to power three because it's a three dimensional space. That's why you have eight gluons. And these are they act like digits. They act like binaries. So it's a three that it's a it's it's a three bit truth table. That's really what it is. That's why you have eight outputs. And they correspond to the outputs that are possible in prime determination. Within my model, that is. So going back to this Koide formula, you can see that the masses themselves are, uh, they are geometric. And this is what you, you would expect if the masses are being uh, invariant or properties of a very particular type of three-dimensional space. Now, the reason why you have this Koide formula and the two-thirds of it is because summary of it is that these spaces are controlled by that six. And since it's a, it's a three-dimensional uh, space, then the, the correspondence is between two coordinate systems only for these three masses out of the post potential three coordinate systems that there that they are. The masses are determined from the by the interaction from two coordinates. Now it is um when you uh, do some research into the value of the Koide formula for the electron for the charged leptons that is, you know, the strangeness of it all comes from the fact that these three masses seem very arbitrary. And yet somehow when you do this relationship, this formula for involving these three arbitrary looking masses you get a value that is two-thirds you know a simple fraction and that's the puzzling thing well i mean fractions are basically comparisons between two numbers so two-thirds means you are comparing two with three and since we now understand that numbers are not one-dimensional things but three-dimensional things so you're looking at the comparison between three-dimensional objects two three-dimensional objects and the ratio between them is always two-thirds so if you look at the space of, of where these according to my model where these particles are supposed to reside and the space that they that generates them then you will be able to see where this two-thirds is coming from like i've told you the entire model resonates with in terms of its structure resonates with three threeness but within it the prime algorithm itself is rotate it's basically rotating or or moving along according to sixes and the, the, all the particles need to because they are invariants they need to arrange themselves in such a way that they are realizable now this what we what eventually what becomes an electron is a sum total of all the vibrations and the resonances within that electron field itself which for instance takes place on on a particular a particular coordinate system a particular axis coordinate axis you see where it is stable because the re reverberations go on forever so it is the you can say it is the fundamental mode the fundamental harmonic of that particular coordinate system now the moon the mu the muon and the tau are overtones resonances so you can imagine that one coordinate references another coordinate because there are three coordinate systems in this model one coordinate ref references another coordinate and then references the other coordinate. So you have itself and then you have two overtones corresponding to its relationship with the other two. And they all do this. That's where the three generations are coming from because they are, they, they, that means that the expression of the possibilities are restricted to these three broad categories. And that's why it's, I'm fairly confident that you can't have a fourth generation of fundamental particle. You see? And the reason for that is because you can see from their masses, they're, based on the value of their masses, you can tell that they're coming from that three-dimensional space. And that's why the, mat the masses correlate. And in my book, in The Five Principles of Organized Complexity, I show you the three-dimensional structure that holds the masses. It, it in essence, prescribes them. And that's why, you know, I have not really agreed, I have not resonated with this idea of uh, uh, energy cancellations or mass cance cancellations like you have in, uh, or fine-tuning like you have in, 
uh, in when you compute these things through Feynman diagrams you see but the issue is just formalism because the if you take the uniqueness of this three-dimensional space right in, in mathematics today if you have a three-dimensional space and you don't know what it is you have to you have to investigate it you have to investigate its topology and you also have to investigate its geometry so the topology is that you know it doesn't have any holes in it per se and the geometry of it is the way that it expands because it's a uniform type of expansion meaning if you look at the larger scales and the smaller scales you will see the same differences and the differences are geometric, the way they scale. So you can have, because they have the powers of the primes and powers of the natural numbers. You see? It, I created a model that visualizes what that space looks like. You know, just simple thing to do on Excel, Microsoft Excel. Where you can look at how the powers of primes are, exp how the powers of the natural numbers are expanding. What is the difference between 8 raised to the power 10 and, the, and 8 raised to the power 9? What's the difference with that with 8 raised to the power 7? So these are these are numerical values, and so they have differences between them. Now the way those differences scale, you can see that the differences are getting larger and larger, but they are getting larger and larger at a fixed, at a predetermined geometric rate. Now there is not one geometric rate for all of them. You see, but the way they form a space that is expanding uniformly. Meaning that any type of resonance that reverberates within that space, wherever that reverberation takes place, the gross rate of that reverberation is exactly the same. Whether it's taking place at the smallest scales or the larger scales, the expansion is the same. And that's exactly what Riemann's hypothesis is based on. It's talking about the nature of expansion on that in that particular space. But because of the machinery of how this was derived, it's not intuitive. You see? But if that's, those non-trivial zeros are describing the space upon which the primes live, then they are basically looking at that space from a spectral point of view. You see, It's like taking a gong and hitting it very loud in this space and then you watch for the echoes, how the, how the sound wave reverberates according to the geometry of, the, of this space. Now, what I'm saying is that if you take, no matter the intensity of the gong, even if it's the loudest gong possible or the smallest gong possible, once you strike it, the way that the waves emanate and expand is the same across all scales. And that's why when you look at the scale of the universe, if you look at the Big Bang, the emanation of the, big, of the universe from the singularity or you know, the creation of something. It has this broad reverberations too. It's the same thing. It's simply one, two, and three and the powers. That's it. So you can find that the equation that describes this uh, big bang, it's very simple. It's like striking a bell. Bong. And then it just reverberates in a continuous manner. And now that's what's responsible for the large scale structure that's found in the universe all the complexity that we see they are coming because no they are coming from the reverberations what are the reverberations because that's what Riemann's uh, non-trivial zeros are describing what are the reverberations they are the ways in which the sixes connect to themselves it is the dynamic of those sixes the way that they connect to themselves up down and because they always connect because that's what six does that's what when these connections find something that can mimic it right that's what we call life so the, the sixes themselves they they take a, man, a physical form in the form of carbon and they begin to connect with themselves that carbon connecting with itself forms long chain organic whatever that's the whole basis for organic chemistry this is related to the mass distributions it's all the same i, I, I don't understand why it should be different it cannot be different. If it were different, then reality would have a, a discontinuous point, a singularity. You know, the, the, the geometry is smooth. Even at the discontinuities that we call black holes, right? That's not the end of that story. There's something missing from that understanding. Because the black holes would represent a discontinuity in the expansion, you see? And so something else is going on there. Now, I have conjectured that all singularities whether they belong to supermassive black holes or just normal range black holes all singularities collapse into the original singularity 
So every singularity, now this forms the basis for what I propose as quantum gravity. All singularities, the collapsing structure which they form, connects them from when they collapse to the Big Bang. So they go through all that time history they, because they collapse through space, they collapse through time also. It is the collapse of space and time. That's what that singularity is. And so that is the Big Bang. So you can imagine, if you, if you imagine the universe as some type of extremely large light bubble for instance now every black hole would you would see it as a single as a point in in space in that extremely large bubble of light but if you could see it in totality you would see that point falling all the way back to the original singularity from where the universe came from so you would see all these points are connected to the to the to the same source so you have all the black holes all over the universe they are connected back to the original singularity so if you if a, if a black hole formed today 13.8 billion years away from the the big bang it would collapse across the entire 13.8 billion years so just imagine that you could because normally when a, a singularity a gravitational singularity like that forms it just collapses all the way to infinity all the way to the the singularity imagine if somehow you could restrict the collapse and it could just collapse for maybe 2 billion years you've simply created a a, a, a time portal because one part of the, the singularity is at today and the other part is at two is from at 2 billion years ago so imagine you could kind of tune this like a lens of some kind you can tune the focal point of the of the, the the collapsing singularity or the collapsing black hole you can tune how far it collapses then you have a time you have a time portal into the past you know so th these are all einstein's special relativity and all the quirks of it but going back to the coide formula because that's where you know why these you know I want to read something from Wikipedia. You know, I know it's not a very credible source, but I reckon it's yep, it's referenced. So we'll look at the reference. So the mystery of the Coide formula, especially as, as applies to the electrons, the muons, and the tau, is in that the value itself. You know, it's peculiar. It you know, it's a simple fraction. But in Wikipedia, it says the mystery is in the physical value. Not only is the result peculiar in that three ostensibly arbitrary numbers give a simple fraction, but also in that in the case of electron, muon, and tau, Q, which is the value of the Coide formula, is exactly halfway between the two extremes of all possible combinations. That is, one third if the three masses were equal, and one if one mass dominates. Now, Robert Foote, I guess somebody in also interpreted the Coide formula as a geometrical relation in which the value 1 over 3q is the squared cosine of the angle between the vector, the absolute value, the root of electron mass, the root of the muon mass, and the root of the tau mass, and the vector 1, 1, 1. Robert Foote says that that angle is almost exactly 45 degrees. That's exactly what I've been trying to say. That's what I've been describing. The problem is that even though Robert Foote can figure out that such a relationship has to hold if the Coide formula is correct. It is correct because from two of the masses, you can predict the third based on that accurately. So there is a relationship. So he envisages it as the relationship between the angle between two vectors. So you have 1, 1, 1, which is, you know, literally a straight line in a three-dimensional axis the 45 degree line if you take two axes and you find the exact middle between them two coordinate axes and you find the exact middle between them the angle is 45 degrees because it splits the 90 degree angle between the two coordinate axes into two it's one half that's exactly the Riemann's that's it Riemann's hypothesis but now because one of the coordinates the middle coordinate right is apparent it looked like a third dimension it behaves like a third dimension for all intents and purposes and that's why we have a three-dimensional universe one of the dimensions is apparent that's what the, the masses are telling us they're telling us about the nature of our the dimension of space where that we live in we tend to think of space as homogeneous in a sense no right now we think of space geometrically because of einstein's redefinition and his general relativity 
we think of space and time simultaneously co combined because you can't really tell the difference between the two. They are interwoven by the speed of light. So based on that now, Einstein was able to create a stress energy tensor, some type of metric that qualifies the stretch and the strain, the pulling and the pushing that is going on in space, space that looks empty and flat, essentially has forces within it that are pushing and pulling, you know, and that pushing and pulling is what Einstein described as gravity because there are distortions or contortions in the geometry of that space-time. So the stress energy that is created when during contortions, that's what's responsible for. That's what we see as gravity, you see. But this is a behavior that is prescribed by the space itself. The nature of that space, the reason why it behaves like and the reason why gravity behaves like that is still down to this same distribution of prime numbers. If you construct the model, you see it. What Einstein calls a time dilation is a property of the model, easy property. The fact that the speed of light is constant, no matter the frame of reference, is a property of the space. The space-time itself, the, and the space-time itself emerged from this distribution of prime numbers so you can imagine these three coordinates and in one of the axes you have this extreme scaling which makes the tau because the tau is basically the sorry the top quark is a resonant the the three generations are simply the, they are the same thing because they are both individual coordinate axes the problem is the type of scaling that is taking place on them and because they are, these, these things are best investigated spectrally in a sense, the sound is always the same. It doesn't matter if you're hitting the drum at infinity or you're hitting the drum in the beginning. The way that the space behaves is uniform in that sense. It has its peculiarities uniform. You know, it's a paradox of some kind, but it's true. So the resonances form because of the unique, the the places at which the geometry of the space changes significantly, that place becomes a resonating point that we call a particle. So the smooth the smoothness of the space, right? The smoothness of the expansion, the smoothness of that space, that's what an electron is. If I just interpret an electron as a, a fractal 3D coordinate system, See, it's a point source, yes, but it's a it's the fra it's a fractal representation of the 3D coordinate system itself. So it's extremely stable. It's like a fundamental mode of of of, of the of the space. But it has two other lookalikes that are self similar to it, except for mass. And mass is simply energy. And energy in this paradigm simply is the like a stress energy tensor. The difference now is. That stress energy tensor is connected to a decay time, a decay constant. So each part, for instance, the, the, the tau, right, has a short, shorter lifetime than the muon. But both are unstable in a sense. They decay into an electron and an ele electron neutrino in some cases anyway. And that's because the, the smoothness, the, fun, the, the fractal nature of that electron basically references itself with the two coordinate systems so the image of the electron on these two coordinate systems that's what the muon and the tau are but because these are just resonance states they are unstable they're like reflections they're like echoes or something like that and so the change of mass between the electron and the the tau for instance you can see that the, the tau is way heavy the, the tau is 170 no, 1776 or 77 mev compared to the electrons 0.51 mev so you can see that there is a uh, almost 3500 times the the tau is like 3500 times heavier than the electron and that's the scaling that takes place now the in terms of lifetime of the tau it is proportionally short to correspond to that heavy mass so you can see that the the thing that determines the decay time or the lifetime of the tau and the muon they are the same things that they come from the, the thing that gives these particles their masses so you can think of the electron as belonging to a spring a unit spring that is extremely flexible such that once you set it into vibration it's it, it goes into resonance easily. It becomes its own resonating state. So it literally resonates with itself 
and so it propagates everywhere. There's no dampening for it. And you can imagine the Tal and the Muon as heavier springs, such that they are so heavy, when you try to raise them up, they vibrate with a strong energy, meaning they go back to their rest state. When you, type, when you try to distort them, they go back to their rest state very quickly because they're very heavy. So that represents a layer of, the, of this model, three-dimensional model, that does not vibrate easily. And the reason is because they are reflections. They are not, they're apparent. It is the electron referencing these two coordinate systems. So it references one coordinate system. It references one coordinate system it, that reflects upon itself. So it's stable. The resonance is sustained. But then it references the second coordinate system where the scaling is different. And so this reference has a resonance, but the resonance is unstable and very short-lived. And then it references the third dimension, which has another different scaling property on it. And the, ref the, the reference has a resonance, but even with shorter, uh, shorter lifetime and very unstable. So they disappear very quickly. And the same thing is happening with all the other up quark and the down quark. So you can see that the electron, the up quark and the down quark, they belong to some type of, they have this, some type of relationship in the sense that they are, because the up quark and the down quark are relatively stable when they are bound in, for instance, as a proton, even though a proton has a decay uh, lifetime that is more than the lifetime of the whole universe. But the neutron is unstable. A neutron would decay into a proton and and uh, an, elec an electron or something. Right? To decay into a, a proton and something else. Because the neutron and the and the proton, they're, they're in an iso state, an iso spin state. So you can see that. And, and what, what's the description of the proton? The proton is two up quarks and a down quark. But between the neutron and the proton, they have this combination of, of quarks. Three quarks, where two are the same. So it's stable in a sense, that configuration. But if you have the opposite, which is you know, the two down quarks and an up quark, then it's unstable that's the neutron in a sense but you see so there's a reason for that and that has to do with the energy level the end the mass of the up quark and the down quark the down quark is heavier than the up quark not by much but just a tiny little bit you see so they have configurations the stability configurations that they prefer and the reason is because what stability means is that the resonance that is taking place within the, the space does not die out it doesn't get damped easily it's undamped in a sense that's when you have a long a these first generation particles but when you get to the second generation particle and the third generation particle then the damping is more intense more energetic that energetic damping that is what is responsible for that is what that mass is telling you for instance the top quark now with uh, with 170 something gev as mass that is the the resistance to vibration you need to spend that amount of energy before the possibility of a top quark appears and since a quark is since particles are just resonant states then it means that whatever is supposed to vibrate is so reluctant to vibrate. So you can imagine it as the stiffness of a spring. You can imagine all the particles as representing various stiffness coefficients. But instead of stiffness, you can imagine them as the stress energy tensors of a particular space. Just like you have the stress energy tensor defining the geometry of space-time. You also have a stress energy tensor, but it's not space-time. It's of its space time but it's not uh it's the quantum nature of space time you know, the difference between quantum gravity and macro gravity is the calibration of space time space time is a metric that's all it is and it's a metric that allows things to be divided up in equal measure or according to measurement so that they occupy the same relation so that they have if so that they maintain specific relationships between themselves because the six is they, they must be preserved the connectivity of the entire universe or the entirety of existence must be preserved completely absolutely so physical constants take the values that they do to preserve the unity of existence. That's really what it is. And so all physical constants are related to each other. That does away with the idea of fine-tuning. What, what is fine-tuning a physical constant? It's another physical constant. It's the whole of the other physical constants that fine-tune a particular physical constant to, be, to give it the value that it has. It's the same thing. All the prime numbers determine where every other prime number is going to be. It's a very rigid space, just like existence. And so the particle values, the fundamental particle mass values, they are what they need to be to ensure the connectivity of existence. That's how they are all united. That's why. And the unity is geometric because the number system upon which they are based has geometric underpinnings. If it didn't have geometric under underpinnings, Einstein could not have a general theory of relativity. You could not have a special theory 
theory of relativity, you also could not have a constant as the, as the, as the speed of light. You could not have a gravitational constant. You could not have any of these things. These constants exist because there is a unity across all of existence. Now, in our type of existence, there is a three-dimensional quality to it. And one of those dimensions is apparent. It is the resultant of the other two. That's really what it is. So the Coide formula for the electron, the muon, and the tau, right, is approximately two-thirds because it is a comparison between two vectors. On one vector, the values are determined absolutely, and on the other vector, they are determined as a kind of reflection or resonance. On one axis, that property is 2. On the other axis, that property that is 2 is now expanded to 3. So it's a comparison between the, the diagonal that determines 2 and the diagonal that determines 3. And this is the same relationship that exists between all the multiples of 2 compared to all the multiples of 3. The relationship is the same. It's still 2 thirds. And that's what the Coide formula is telling us. So it's telling us that the about the relationship between those masses because you know you have to understand that mass is a very because the, th the third dim dimension of our space is basically apparent mass is a very slippery thing and that's why you had all that formalism of higgs and the higgs boson it's a formalism to try to inject mass into a description of reality that is supposed to be massless. That's really what it is. But because the third dimension is apparent, mass is apparent. I mean, it looks like everything has mass, but it's apparent. It's some type of vibrational behavior of entire coordinate systems and over and its overtones self-interacting. It's really what it is. So it's the really and in this particular case between the electron the 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 muon and the tau it is between two coordinate axes so if you can if you know it's best to just look at this a pictorial level because i have a diagram that depicts how two dimensions x and the x and y coordinate system has a resultant in the z direction which is like a 45 degree line running through the plane the x and y plane but that z is a resultant so it's apparent it exists by virtue of the other two coordinate systems and so we have a three-dimensional universe that looks apparent. But something is going on in that apparent dimension. It's vibrating. Now, the two coordinate systems themselves, the original two coordinate systems, they are vibrating, but the vibration runs along the coordinate system in three sixes. But when it comes to the middle, the Z dimension, the Z coordinate system, it's vibrating with three sixes. But the coordinate itself is also vibrating with three sixes. So there is vibration along the coordinate in three sixes. And there's vibration of the coordinate itself in three sixes. It's a very unique structure. Only the entire, only existence as a whole has this property. But this property is what creates existence. These coordinate systems and the sixes that are vibrating, that are basically vibrating on it and with it. And this sets everything in existence. It tries to tune everything in existence to vibrate at that with those same sixes. Now, the things that can vibrate with those same sixes in such a way that they be they start becoming resonant with it, that's what we call life. And self-aware life is a step up in that vibration, where the vibration, the resonance is so strong now that the sixes are be start becoming aware of themselves. That's what you are as a human being. You're the three sixes vibrating. Because that's the vibration in the entire universe. The entire universe is not vibrating with three sixes along these coordinate systems and of these coordinate systems. The universe is the system. Existence is the system. It's like a, a piper that is playing a tune continuously. The only people who dance to the music are those who hear the tune and understand it. Then they begin to dance in accordance to the melodies of the tune. Those things that dance the most, they are the things that we call living things. And the one that becomes self-aware is the one that is living but also knows the tune so well that it can begin to extend different variations of the tune. It all in accordance with the tune. And that, you know, that we're not very good at doing that today, and that's why our entire complex system of a planet, complex system of existence, is going out of sync. We have prioritized other things outside of the tune. So we have taken the tune, we can hear it, we understand it, so we are self-aware, but we have extended it in ways that are not harmonic with the original tune itself. And so, because of that disturbance, we are nudging systems that normally synchronize because of the sixes. We are nudging them into disharmony. 
And if they go into disharmony, we can't really nudge them into disharmony. We just can't. But what we can do is we can create such disharmony, disharmonious conditions that life as we know it, human life as we know it, and life on this planet as we know it becomes unpleasant. It's it, you know it, it doesn't become it's no longer as easy as, because the system will need to take time to listen to the piper, and based on the intru- instructions of the piper, it will resynchronize itself, giving a long ge- geological time. Earth is able, the planet Earth is able to do that. That's why Earth is, is able to sustain life. Because all the processes that run on the Earth, somehow they mimic the song of this piper. Somehow they're in tune with it, they're in resonant state with it. The, remember, the piper is the three sixes are playing all over, as the universe. And that's why any, any life form you see anywhere in the universe, it has to have the six at the, at the, at the backbone of it. That's what it means to be living. It's carbon. I know we speculate a lot in, in science fiction about how we could have other life forms based on silicon or based on... Because, I mean, if something can organize based on carbon, it can also organize based on silicon because silicon is directly under carbon on the column of the periodic table. But no, silicon doesn't have the rate of energy exchange, the flexibility, the property of being organized and yet loose. It doesn't have that organized complexity. And even though we can use silicon to create microchips because we can etch sophisticated complex electrical circuitry on it, there is a limit. That's the same thing that limits the production of microchips on, you know, in terms of size, how, how much can be packed into a single wafer or something like that. But carbon doesn't have any of those limitations. It has its own limitations. But the limitations are prescribed by the by the entire universe. So carbon is able to form a structure that is so dense and yet so that is so organized and looks disorganized at the same time. It's like an example of chaos. But that is what how carbon arranges itself if it wants to resonate with the original pipe piper and all the music being played. And it is this resonance that is self-awareness. And the resonating structure is your brain. Your brain self-organizes itself as it is as the human being was developing and forming. As the human being paid more attention to the pipe piper's music, universal music, that music self-organized all the molecules in the brain, pushing it towards a structure whereby self-awareness can flare up. Where it achieves a certain level of critical complexity or critical density self-awareness emerges so these are just these are levels of organization and i'm what i'm trying to say is that that organization is encoded in the distribution of prime numbers we find it in the part the fundamental particles as the geometric invariance of the space of existence that is underlined by the distribution of prime numbers that's why and in, in one of my other podcasts i talked about how when six manifests on earth it manifests as carbon and carbon is black that's the way it looks to us it's not so you know basically when you look at an object the color that you see on that object is the color that is rejected by the thing so based on that that thing is telling you its nature by the color that every natural system is telling you what it is by the color that it's 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 rejecting because the color is a broadcast system it's telling you about its nature so you see a red apple, it's it's basically imbibed all the other colors and rejected. Of course, there's no exactly red apple, but you can see that predominantly looks red to your eyes. So that is the color that it is rejecting. So it is speaking in the language of colors. And that's what all natural things do. As long as they are responding to the natural pipe piper, the sixes that they are playing out as the whole of existence. So green plants are green because they are responding. They are telling you something. So there's communication. There's the, ent- the entirety of creation is speaking. And when it comes to living things and how they express themselves, color is a very, very important uh, mode of expression. Especially for, non- for non-self-aware living things. So carbon is black because all the light that falls on it, nothing gets expressed. So it's telling you of its nature. Everything that it receives, it keeps. It uses it for organization. It doesn't reject anything. So it's almost like, it's like carbon is the ultimate Lego brick for complex organization. That's because carbon is based on the six. 
numerically carbon is a six it's just a six it's just a number but in order for it to make sense in our three-dimensional reality then we see it as a particular type of organization that thing which we call carbon is really just a geometry that has been frozen a geometry imposed on energy you know it could have been anything it could have been with five with four with no it's six there's a reason obviously and, and it's black you see and things that tend to be things that tend to form the fulcrum upon which complex organization is built they tend to be black if you look at your brain for instance now the organization of your brain is not just about the organization there is distribution of blackness in your brain that distribution is what allows us to be self-aware so the, the the dark pigment is used strategic strategically in your brain there's a place now called the substantia nigra it's a dark place you know and there are all all other types of dark uh, uh grayed out because what is gray gray just means that there is a distribution of black stuff in it but it is uniform and not too dense so gray is just a a uh, description of the density of black stuff as it's distributed within the organization and the most important part of our brain in terms of what allows us to be human is the gray matter the so-called gray matter what do you think why do you think it's gray is because within that gray matter you have these huge new this neuro pyramidal neurons at least they're called pyramidal because of their shape now, they could have been anything they could have been circular they could have been square they could have been all sorts of things but they look like a triangle and especially you know if you look at the 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 cortical structure the gray so-called gray matter that has six layers to it relatively roughly speaking you know for all mammals including humans you would see that in the fifth layer you have these huge pyramidal neurons that control the motor neurons they have to be huge because they're, they're basically controlling muscles so there's some type of capacitance isn't it and the neuron is a fundamental the, the neuron is a marvel of engineering because it's one thing that is so many things People think that its function is just to charge and discharge. No, it's very multifaceted because the organization that it is part of is multifaceted too. That's how we can achieve. You know, self-awareness is a criticality. It's a point where awareness comes. Before it comes, you don't know what awareness is because cognition is distributed. And because it is distributed, it is dragged by all the stimulus in the environment. So they can't. it is difficult to form a point of focal attention. Now, the type of intelligence that we believe that we are, and there's a reason why I'm framing it that way, is the type of intelligence, self-aware intelligence that can form a focal point in our minds. We can concentrate on one thing and tune everything else out. Now, some animals can do this when they focus on danger and things like that, you know, threats to life and all that. But we are able to use our own focusing to be able to do this, something really special. We can do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and on and on and on. We can even conceptualize zero, nothing. Now, one, two, three, these are numbers are representations of something underneath. And what is underneath is a concept. But that concept is a geometry. Because why? One, zero is nothing, obviously. Then one is one object. Then you have two, which is the relationship between one and itself. These are the fledgling lights of consciousness, self-awareness. So what really sparked in the human mind as self-awareness is fundamentally geometric. And the first light, whether you believe it or not, the very first light is not the light of the singularity of you know, 300 and some 380,000 years after the Big Bang when there was a decoupling of radiation from the plasma. No, it is the first light of self-awareness because it represents a criticality, a transition point, a bifurcation point, a reflection point of sorts. Because now an object can do me, you. And that's how it starts. From one to two. And once you can go from one to two, then you can go from 
one to three why because that two plus that one will give you three and on and on it goes like a fibonacci sequence that's the nature of the emergence of cognition it's the same pattern that is in the, the geometrical interpretation of the fundamental masses that's what i'm trying to say at some point you gotta wonder why we understand the universe why why does anything make sense how can we able to understand to the point where we can interact with and interfere with the way the universe operates and the animals can't really do the other animals cannot really do that even the primates the closest primates to a human being can't do that so prior to now we can we've only understood all these things philosophically metaphorically but i'm saying that there's a physical scientific provable explanation why and that that explanation is the same explanation for everything else in terms of everything else you need to know about our existence type of existence that we have because truth connects to truth once you discover the truth in one area then you can ex you can stretch it to every other area because it's the truth so it's expected to be true that's really what it is so that's that's uh you know that's basically the masses of these fundamental particles you know the, my book contains a lot more a lot more i mean my book is 206 pages the five principles of organized complexity where i i run through everything and obviously it's impossible to go through go in detail into every possible concept and their relationship but you know i just go as far as i can in terms of being able to highlight significant places where these events are or where i have noticed these things and you know i'm sure there's a lot more representation because everything needs to behave according to this model that i have described and one part of my book you know i really focus on particle physics you know i just i just feel that because one of the best ways to really register an impact with these ideas is to make a prediction to explain something that has not been explained before and then to use that explanation to make a testable or provable prediction see like for instance out of this model emerged that there are two unknown fundamental particles now i suspect that they're bosons force carrying particles force carrying resonances and the model from which I extrapolate their behavior, their, their existence is a simple model that has to do with isospin, hypercharge, and electric charge. Because like I told you, every all the constants conspire amongst themselves to be what they are. They cannot be anything else. So within the constants of nature and their interaction, their, the conspiracy that exists between them, within them resides every other constant. And somehow six sits at the center of everything it's that's in so unique and sits at the very center the relationship between all the constants of nature we just don't have for you to be able to see the relationship you just need the appropriately defined space because that's what happens when we understand something we change something within our minds we create another layer and all that we don't just see how everything fits together but it is not everything that is fitting together it is we the way the the, the way that understanding sits within ourselves the way that different aspects of us are coming together. That's really what's happening because the truth has always been out there. We are here on this earth because of that truth. And everything in existence is here because of that truth. So it's already there. Discovery is simply the process of changing different aspects of ourselves to accommodate what we have now come to know. And that's why I have predicted very boldly that the more we learn about the principles of organized complexity... The, w the more we know about how the sixes connect, the more we understand the, how these things also lead to the general behavior of our personalities, individual personalities, the sense of I which we feel, the more we will change. Because the wisdom or the knowledge changes us, changes our behavior, just like how quantum physics changed our reality in terms of the technology and all that but it's not just the technology that changed the weirdness or what we call the weirdness of quantum mechanics has forced a re-realization of certain things that were taken as absolutes even in the social sphere and the political sphere and everything it changes it, its impact can be felt across a lot of things so it has tended because of the weirdness of it it has tended to make people oh, very much open-minded as in you don't know what's possible so you tend to be open to all sorts of ideas and that changes us it is the process of resynchronization and lots hum, many human beings are responding to the signal 
Some are choosing to ignore it because as a human you can do that. But at the end of the day, the movement is eternal. It's like swimming up the tide. It's like swimming against the tide or against the current. Against the universal current, whatever you want to call it. But the universal current is the current of organization. Complex organization. Now, why is it complex? It's because that's what it is. When you can link up different aspects of yourself, you can form all sorts of computations, all sorts of derivations. That's the whole essence of creativity. It's all down to the sixes. In fact, the reason why human beings have grown to the point where we enjoy sex, that pleasure which we feel, that enjoyment which we seek, in a sense, it's a representation of the need to connect. It's a representation of the sixes. Otherwise, we don't need to connect with, you know, have male, female, and then you are, all, you know, and then you are drawn together almost by instinct. No, not almost, by instinct, literally. And that keeps the human race going. I mean, the, we're not drawn together because we are compelled to reproduce in, just for the sake of reproduction. No. It's almost like the choice is taken away by infusing that aspect of existence with a tremendous amount of pleasure in such a way that we'll always seek that pleasure. So we seek the pleasure and it, by consequence of that, we reproduce. Do you think that's a coincidence? That pleasure, the nature of that pleasure, the prescription for that type of pleasure is coming from the sixes because the sixes all connect. They have to connect because unity, existence must be totally unified. So the pleasure and the connection, it's all just another way of looking at the sixes. Just another way of looking at the same thing. That's really what it is. Just before I, I end this, I want to talk about the, the weak force. Remember I said my model predicts two extra particles, two extra resonance states. And it predicts them one with right chirality and the other with a left chirality. Now... It is my conjecture that these are bosons. Now, it doesn't say anything about their masses, or any, whether they're massless and all that. But I suspect that they, these two particles are related to, to the force carriers, in, in a sense. Because you have to look at it this way. Since the Pied Piper, the universal language, is the vibration of these three sixes. The vibration of three sixes along the X coordinate. The vibration of three sixes along the Y coordinate. The vibration of three sixes along the Z coordinate. Now, the vibration of the Z coordinate itself also has three sixes. And then this entire structure is interacting with itself. That's really what it is. Now, that's the, the universal pipe piper. Now, anything else that anything in existence that resonates, that matches the resonation of this pipe pipe, universal pipe piper, that thing begins to move in accordance to that resonance. It begins to vibrate. That is the same type of vibration that crafted all the physical laws, all the physical constants, all the... The constants are simply those aspects of existence that are basically stable in this interacting field or interacting space of sixes. That space has certain properties. You measure it and all, you know? But these, I'm suspecting that these two extra particles belong to the bosons. Because for me, there are four bosons currently, and you have the boson for the strong force, called the gluon. You have the boson for the electrical for uh, electromagnetic force, which is the photon. You have the bosons for the weak force, which are the W and the Z bosons. And the W comes in positive and negative. But these belong to one boson, so I count them as one. The W and the Z belong to the same weak force. The Z is responsible for the W is responsible for changing flavor or particle type. The Z is responsible for converting particle to antiparticle or part or antiparticle to particle. So it is neutral electrically neutral. But the W has a positive and a negative. Now, so there are four, as far as I am concerned, there are four boson classes. And if the structure of particle physics needs to resonate in tandem with the Pied Piper, the universal Pied Piper of sixes, then there has to be six boson categories. So there are two more forces, there are two more types of interaction in the universe that are currently unknown. But those interactions, like I've said in many of my podcasts, those interactions are within us because they are us, they formed us and we reflect them. So currently they just represent, currently because we 
do not know them, then it means that we are not aware of those things within ourselves. The two of them. And I, I suspect that this relates to gravity. And once you do, once they, once they're complete, then okay. I just remembered the Higgs boson because the Higgs boson, but the Higgs boson is a scalar boson. It's not really a force carrier. That's why it's scalar. So you can't really group it in the standard model of the force carrying bosons. It's not. It's very different from them in the sense that it carries no force. It does not. It's, it's not represented like a vector. It doesn't. You know, probably doesn't. You know doesn't have a direction it doesn't have a motive it just exists as this background all pervading whatever basically the architecture of 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 you know i'm not really sure what to call it so i suspect the two missing particles belong to the gravitational aspect of existence or what we call the gravitational aspect of existence and that one of them could be the graviton don't know but i know that two of them are connected to that aspect of macro existence can't really say much about what they are but in my model in one of my models i was able to describe i was able to produce a table and within that table describe the part the fundamental particles according to uh, these uh, some constants all based on the six now for the dsb quarks which is the down the strange and the bottom quarks i describe them by the following numbers five over six minus five over six and then minus one over six. That's how I define them in my model. For the that's for the left chiral DSB quarks. For the right chiral DSB quarks, I define them by two over six, minus two over six, four over six, and minus four over six. There's a detailed whatever underneath all of that, but these are just signature numbers because at the end of the day, these are resonance states of sixes. So we need to define them by the sixes, and each one carries their own signature like that. For the UCT quarks, they have three values, 7 over 6, 5 over 6. That's the left chiral UCT quarks. 7 over 6, 5 over 6, and then 1 over 6. For the right chiral UCT quarks, we have 4 over 6, minus 4 over 6, 8 over 6, and minus 8 over 6. Now, for the left chiral neutrinos, they are defined by two numbers 3 over 6 minus 3 over 6 and 9 over 6 now there are no there's no category for right chiral number uh, right chiral neutrinos not because they don't exist they just haven't been detected yet and the reason for that is because when you look at the right chiral dsb quarks you look at the right chiral uct quarks there is a pattern there there is they seem to be the even numbers over 6 so there is 2 over 6, there's minus 2 over 6, there's 4 over 6, there's minus 4 over 6. Then there's 8 over 6 and minus 8 over 6. But that's 2, 4, and 8. It doesn't work like that. There's something missing. It's supposed to be 2, 4, 6, 8. So 6 over 6 is missed. Now, for the right, it is my conjecture that for the right chiral neutrinos, that's right-handed neutrinos, they exist. But they carry 6 over 6 and minus 6 over 6. That's the signature that they carry. Now, the reason is because you need a difference to 6 before you can detect the impact. Now, so the right chiral neutrinos exist, but they are being masked by the effect of the W boson, a positive and negative W boson, which also has the signature of plus and minus 6 over 6, plus and minus 12 over 6. So basically, it is one of my conjectures that if you can mask the effect of the W boson, then you will detect right-handed neutrinos. Now, how do you mask the effect of the W boson? I don't know. But the W boson, the presence or the, per the pervasiveness of the W boson is the reason why right-handed neutrinos have not been detected. Now, for the charged leptons, which is the electron, the, uh, the muon, and the tau, you have two numbers minus 9 over 6 and 3 over 6 and for the Higgs boson you have 3 over 6 minus 3 over 6 and minus 9 over 6 you see and you can also plot these on a graph on a special type of graph so you now see the relationship between all of these particle classes particle types the graph is basically uh, it's like a field of 6 so that's really what it is. And there you just see all the particles. And if you do that, you'll be able to detect that two particles are missing. 10 over 6 and 11 over 6. 
Now, there's a reason why the weak force prefers left-handedness. People were puzzled by that. Why does the weak force prefer... Why does nature have a preferred direction? The directions are not supposed to be important to nature. And so, but it's not. Na- it's the weak force. Because of the way that it is, the way that, it's con- the way that it fits into the unity of everything, the geometry of everything, it interacts more with left chirality than with right chirality. It tends to blend into right chirality in such a way that they, it neutralizes right chirality. You see? A similar kind of thing takes place in the antimatter-matter asymmetry in the universe. The universe has a preference for matter. And it's all down to this. It still comes down to this weak force. The weak force is the strangest force. Why? Because it is the force that is engaged. It is, that's how prime computation looks in the physical universe. You know, the, the, the algorithm that determines what is prime and what is not prime that is running on my model, that's the weak force. It is a projection. That's how it's able to touch all the fundamental particles from the neutrinos to the, uh, the protons, the, had, you know, the hadrons. That's really what it is. And the reason why it is pervasive like that is because it has within it plus and minus 6 over 6, plus and minus 12 over 6. Now, 12 over 6 is basically like 6 over 6. It's still multiples or exact multiples of 6s. So it becomes a type of reference point for the operational processes of existence, what we call physics. You see? So that's that's really what it is. And there's a lot, you know, I'm just looking through my my book, The Five Principles of Organized Complexity. So there's a lot in here, you know, there's a lot. Because I talk about the mixing strength potential for the quarks, in terms of why they pref- why they prefer the, the mixing uh, matrices that they do, you know, the type of mixtures that are possible between different, in terms of their decays and all that. So these seem to be prescribed within nature. So I provide a model for that, that explains the interaction, the mixing strengths so to speak, according to the CKM matrix. The CKM matrix, I think, is the... I've forgotten the names of the people. <laughs> the something Kobayashi matrix or something. Mas- Kobayashi Maskawa matrix. Anyway, it is, um, it is pretty interesting. And I have, gone to, I have gone to a lot of length. I try to explain as much as I can into, into the book. Because it's, it's pretty important, you know, that's, you know, because what I'm saying is that everything basically just comes from geometry. And geometry means that, you know, some aspects of the, the space is not homogeneous. Some aspects of the space are behaving in some ways, some aspects of the space are behaving in other ways. But these behaviors are all fixed and they scale smoothly to infinity. And what is this space? It's the space of existence, the space of all possible concepts and their relationships. That's what we call an existence. That's what a universe is. It is a space of existence. I'm just trying to get the full name for the CKM. It's a Japanese uh, name, but it's also a very... Oh, it's a name I used to know very well. I used to pronounce it very frequently. But I haven't looked at some of these things in a while. I have forgotten a couple of them. But you know, everybody, everyone who wants to understand or who wants to view my perspective on existence organized complexity the physics of it the chemistry of it you know the mathematics of it of course when i say mathematics i don't mean there's really no mathematics in my book you see i talk about mathematical philosophies a lot the ideas behind mathematical thinking but no mathematics yeah now i'm looking at talking about yukawa couplings because these the masses i explain as the masses i in in you know in theoretical particle physics, the particles, the, the particles are explained, the masses of the particles are explained as a proportionality of the Yukawa coupling and the VEV, the vacuum expectation value, which is, I think, is about 245 GeV. So all the particle masses become proportionalities of the VEV. So like the vacuum expectation value is predicted by the mass of the Higgs. So that's the, the total, you can call it like, it's almost like saying, the total energy content of of available or total energy content available based on the value of the, the mass of the Higgs. Then, the top mass, the top quark mass, is a proportion of that 245. And right now, the top quark mass is 171 GeV. So it's a proportion of the 245. You see, 
the and so on on it goes now the constant of proportionality is the yukawa coupling and uh, at least that's how it's explained but i've looked at the yukawa coupling very carefully i've looked at the values and how they correlate with each other you can see that all they're just doing is they're tracking the natural numbers on their prime and prime distribution they're tracking the scales because if you if you want to interpret all the masses are basically scaled up copies of themselves they're just scaling in particular according to particular vectors so the the mapping from one vector to and so an electron is basically defined by one vector the top quark mass is basically defined by another vector but the scaling properties of the two vectors are very different so the top quark mass is 171 gev and the electron mass is 0.501 mev see the difference that's just the comparative behavior between two vectors so there are six types of there are six quarks because there are six vectors there are six leptons three charged and three uncharged because there are six vectors and you know there, there are six because the the pipe piper you know the universal pipe piper it's all playing out in sixes so that's really what it is at the end of the day when the two particles are discovered the two missing particles are discovered then the standard model will have a completeness to it which revolves around three sixes six six and six now it could be six potatoes and six apples for all i care it really doesn't make any difference what you call them the fact is that that six is a geometrical related a geometrical relationship that exists within a particular space the fact that there are three of them is because of the three coordinate system itself that's it so in my in my book i also you know use my model to go into the uh, special relativity and just to explain why special relativity has the properties that it does and why general relativity has the properties that it does and basically to say look it is within my model for the principles of organized complexity that's where you find the unified theory whatever you want to call it if you want to call it a unified field theory if you want to call it a universe a unified plate theory or cop, cop theory or book theory whatever it's just a unified theory but it's a unified theory of existence of which the unification already exists in the universe we're not unifying anything but it is a unification of what we consider to be our no self-awareness. So you see, it cannot just be something that is applicable to particles that we don't even, you know, we don't come across every day in terms of our reality. The unification has to be such that it must go all the way to that particulate nature, the wave-like nature, whatever nature you want to call it. But it must also find relevance in our self-aware nature our personality, our behavior, and how we relate and connect to all different types of concepts, it must show up in the way that we relate to each other. Because that is the evolution of the unification process itself, you see. And this happens when we begin to understand the unifications themselves. You know, right now we look at all sorts of things and we have different categories of knowing, you know. You, are gonna, you have a PhD in so many fields of knowledge is beyond belief. But at the end of the day, that all that knowledge revolves around just one understanding, a unity of all understanding based on the same principles. So it is full spectrum knowing based on a simple principle of unity. And then from there you can extend it into any, any field of knowing and you will always find that same truth there, including the field of knowing that is human self-awareness exemplified by behavior personality etc etc that's really what it is well i can't find the name of the, the full name of the ckm matrix i think i'm just gonna google it because you know i have it on the tip of my tongue something kobayashi maskawa that has been quite some time yes yeah, the kabibo kobayashi maskawa matrix and it is the matrix which allows which explains the mixing properties of the known quarks how they tend to mix with each other how they tend to interact how they prefer to interact with each other in terms of their decays so from a top quark when a top quark decays it has preference for it has preference for some quarks and it is forbidden from decaying into some quarks so that structure and that structure is underneath the interactivity model of the of the quarks so part of i mean the kabibo there is you know is, there's a kabibo angle which represents the rotation of the mass eigen state vector space formed by the mass eigen states into the weak eigen state vector space formed by the weak eigen states 
So that's basically what it is. It's, that's just translates into change of identity of a particle. So a quark can change its nature. Maybe from a top quark, it can decay into a D quark, no, into a B quark, into a bottom quark, or it can decay into a strange quark, or it can decay into a down quark. But it is forbidden from decaying into a charm quark or an up quark. You know, now it has a preference, a stronger preference for decaying into a B quark. And a less stronger preference for decaying into a strange quark. And finally, the least preference for decaying into a down quark. But it has absolutely no tolerance for decaying into a charmed quark or an up quark. So that's what I mean. And that's what the... And this ability to, to decay into uh, lower mass particles, that's what is represented by the Kabibo angle. Because it's a geometric... It's envisaged as a geometric rotation that is encapsulated by a matrix. A three-dimensional matrix so that's really what it is and that just tells us that there's an underlying structure so the the the, the fields or the resonating fields or whatever you want to call them the, whose resonance states are the different type of quarks they are angular to each other that's what it means that's what it's telling you if you have to rotate them to they are angular to some and they are parallel to others now parallel states are forbidden that's how it's explained in my book some par parallel states are forbidden but the angular states are allowed based on the, the value of the angle. That just tells you what quarks are. You see, they're, they're basically resonations on vector spaces. You know, it also, that's another proof, another bit of evidence that the universe really is uh, dimensional in the sense, you know, Cartesian in a sense, in coordinate systems. It's just two coordinate systems vibrating, creating an apparent third coordinate system that has all these interesting properties and yet you look around you the universe doesn't feel two-dimensional it doesn't feel one-dimensional it feels three-dimensional all the time in fact everybody believes now that the universe is four-dimensional why because it has space time so three dimensions of space and one of time i don't agree with that time is not a separate dimension sort of time is the algorithm that is running in this three-dimensional space time is the three coordinate systems interacting with each other. The six is linking up. And so nothing really moves per se. You need to understand that time is basically just a resonant state. And if everything is resonating with the sixes simultaneously along and between, then the entire thing is one huge standing wave that contains interference points, constructive and destructive. Time is the awareness of those interfering points. Because our consciousness, what we call time, is literally the same movements because now all of that has been activated, has been actualized as the organization within a human brain or within a living thing's brain. So the entire algorithm, the space is reproduced in the brain as the brain. And because it is reproduced quite faithfully, that's what allows self-awareness to come into existence. And so the dynamic that is contained in the universal Pied Piper, that dynamic is actualized as a brain human brain and it is playing out that playing out process is what time is so time is fundamentally linked to our consciousness that's really what it is fundamentally meaning that it forms the container upon which self-awareness is built awareness of any kind because awareness is a change of state so how are you going to change state when there's no time that's what that time is it is the continual change of state that's all it is it's a clock. And vibrating systems is how we measure time. So time is basically the dynamic of these three coordinate systems and between themselves, along themselves. That's what gives the impression of time because the entire system is vibrating. The leptons themselves, they have a, a different uh, mixing matrix, PKMS. I'm not even going to try to remember what that one is. <laughs> but there was a time when I knew these things off the top of my, you know, when I was writing my book, you know, some of these things I'm saying, they sound very, you know, I don't know if I were, if I don't, didn't understand things the way that I do, or if I didn't see things the way that I do, it would probably be very hard for me to understand, you know, to make sense of what it is that I'm trying to tell you. So, you know, so what are you trying to tell us? Are you trying to tell us that there is nothing like reality, that we're all just numbers, that we're all just like resonant states of numbers, meaning we're just like functions from different number systems to different number systems. We're a scheme. 
there's really no existence per se in terms of hard physical reality it looks like that because we are coupled we are entangled with with physicality so we are physical because we're entangled with it and the process of ent quantum entanglement is something that is not very well understood in terms of what it actually physically means because it is not a coupling of light there are entangled states that can never share information with each other and yet they are entangled so what does that entanglement mean physically now the analogy that I have used is entanglement is akin to knowing something that you have not been told or that you have no evidence for and yet you know it. You are Somehow you are aware of it but the awareness is not based on information or the transmission of light. It is an internal type of knowing that is like, it's almost like faith because you have no proof for this. But two, two physical systems that are entangled and are separated by a faster than light connection. Meaning they will never share information with each other. And yet they are entangled states. Meaning if one is pointing in this direction, then automatically the other one must be pointing in the other direction. But if it's not doing that, then how do we know for sure that that's what it's doing? But entanglement has been proven. It has been proven to exist. So there is another type of transmission of awareness that is not based on light which would make a little bit of sense because there's significant parts of the universe that don't connect with light did you realize do you know that the ratio of baryonic matter which is the kind of matter that we can see and the kind of matter that's entangles with electromagnetic radiation the ratio of baryonic matter to dark matter is six to one so for every one baryonic matter there are six dark matter components whatever they may be that is not a coincidence prime positions occur as three waves each point each crest of the wave each crest of these three waves are separated by sixes now relative to themselves the waves are not really separated by anything but along the along each individual wave now the wave is a, a triplet meaning there are three waves the frequencies of each of these three waves is six and the waves run parallel to each other they're just slightly shifted in phase so if you imagine a prime position as baryonic matter then non-baryonic matter dark matter would become all the non-prime locations that are not involved in this algorithm and you say but why do you need them well it's by design you can't have the prime numbers if you don't if you don't have all the other numbers all the other numbers generate give rise to the primes the primes give rise to all the other numbers so dark matter is what allows baryonic matter to exist and be what it is baryonic matter is what allows dark matter to exist and be what it is whatever it is so based on the fact that the non-trivial zeros describe the landscape upon which the primes then that relationship is also pertinent to the distinction between dark matter and baryonic matter and normal matter these things are all connected. You have so many of these type of relationships that you know that help that basically connect different aspects of understanding together in ways that may not be obvious, but it is what it is. In another important matter, when you talk about the sixes and when people talk about the sixes, there is already there already exists a very negative environment or context regarding the nature of the sixes, and all of that is down to Christianity. Christianity, basically, as part of its wrapping up process, as part of its closure system, right, weaponized itself against the three sixes in your book of Revelations. And you wonder why. Something that's so basic, something that is at the core of truth. Why does Christianity weaponize itself against the three sixes? Well, you can play, you can get creative with all sorts of responses, but the best way to answer that question, at least the, what I have done, is to answer it from a, from a historical point of view. What is Christianity? Some people think that Christianity is the religion of Jesus Christ, where there was this guy that was born, he, was, he had all these powers, he used to preach, love your neighbor as yourself, etc., etc., and ultimately he was killed by people because they were jealous of him, they, you know, he was criticizing them and all that. Do you realize how archetypal this personality type is 
apart from the magical powers that is. This is the archetype of the martyr, you know, the martyr, someone who dies for or somebody who sacrifices themselves for a cause much greater than themselves for the benefit of all of humanity. This is the archetype of that kind of thinking. And what is human response towards that kind of thinking? I mean, when people come in contact with the pure archetype of this, it's a Piscean archetype, it's self-sacrifice. In astrology, we call it we call it a Piscean archetype. We call it the twelfth house archetype, or the archetype of the Neptunian influence, that is very self-sacrificial and self uh, transcend transcendental. What do people meet? What 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 is the response that is evoked from people when they come in contact with this type of transcendental experience or transcendental narrative? It is designed to elicit compassion. That is your response towards this. You feel sorry for this individual or for this person. And you feel sorry in such a way that the, the, the narrative is now weaponized by saying that such a figure came to save you and die for you. So essentially you owe him your existence, your, 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 your reality. And if you owe him your reality, then what do you... You can't say no to the representative of that reality. It means that to the representatives of this reality on earth, you are open all the time. Do you realize how many people Christianity has killed? It has killed more people than any, every plague combined on earth. Every disease, every, every natural catastrophe that has happened on this planet. It has destroyed people beyond... Because that aspect of a human being is one of the highest possible aspects of a human being. And once it is open, you are un amenable to anything, any suggestion, any type of behavior that is elicit elicited of you. You comply, including the most horrendous barbaric behaviors that human beings can conceive of. Christianity is designed as a weapon and it has been one of the chief operating systems of white supremacy. That is the system that is against blackness. That's why the, the end result of the broadcasting system that is white supremacy is anti-black racism. It's a very specific targeted type of weapon. And that's why it basically weaponizes itself against the three sixes because I told you six is black. So an entire myth was constructed. The entire Jesus narrative is all a myth written by very skilled people who are able to elicit to take the archetypes that are responsible or the archetypes that are the dynamics that take place within human consciousness and then to forge narratives out of it so that when you read it you can recognize an aspect of it because the archetypes that are contained within it are the same archetypes that are playing out in your head but ultimately the sculpt the sculpting of this narrative is designed to do what to disempower you so that another can take control if it's such a universal re religion filled with love, how come Christians have been the most barbaric human beings on earth? Hmm? That have committed the most atrocious things you can, human beings can conceive of. Hmm? How? It's the same thing with Islam. These are just narratives that were constructed for what? For the purposes of accumulation of power, money, stature and control. I'm not saying that all of these stories, all of these whatever, are just meaningless, no. But the process of understanding is the process of separating fact from fiction. And the one you know is against fact is the one that weaponizes itself against the three sixes. Demonizes it, gives it a terrible bad name. Paints it as the greatest evil in the world or in existence. This is absolute diabolical. Do you realize that this is absolute blasphemy? If you can imagine blasphemy as, a, as material statements against the very laws of physics. Normally you would say, what the hell? I mean, you can believe in gravity all you want. You can believe in anti-gravity all you want. What difference does it make to the operational activity that is gravity? If you are in a gravitational field, the effect will feel like gravity. It doesn't matter what you believe. But you can't say the same for something like Christianity because Christianity makes statements that are just not true. But because they have a disarming key within them that takes over the human psyche and subjugates it in a sense, then you cannot break out of that. There's no outside of it. It demonizes outside of it and then demonizes the root of existence itself. So it is essentially anti-God. Think about that. Because 
another way you, to understand the sixes is, for instance, in this consciousness that we live in, you have the energy of form. Because that's how we understand physical reality. We understand physical reality as the sensation of duality. Without the sensation of duality, we cannot experience what is called a physical reality. Imagine if your hand could pass through everything you consider material. Then the experience of physicality disappears. But do you realize that it's electrostatic forces that prevent your hand from passing through anything you consider physical or material? And that electrostatic force is a repulsion of some kind. Repulsions and limitations are strictly the, are almost the same thing. That's what they mean. They, a repulsion is a limit. They are boundaries. And when you enter physicality, you define it by limitations, structure, and boundaries. That's because that's what allows form to be possible, the perception of form. And astrologically, these are Saturnian by nature. Just like you can almost say that Christianity is solar by nature but it's not a pure solar because the archetype upon which it skates upon is the piscean archetype and the sun in pisces is said to be in detriment why because the sun cannot express itself in the piscean energy solar impulse is the formation of an ego and the ability of that ego to create by making reference to itself to create in its own image that cannot happen in pisces Pisces is a dissolution of the solar concept. It is a dissolution of the ego. So astrologically speaking, the concept of form, structure, boundaries, limitations, repulsions and all that, they are all Saturnian. And go figure, Saturn is the sixth planet from the sun. You think it's a coincidence? If you look at the, the north pole of Saturn, there's a hexagon there. A cube. A six-sided cube. A hexagon is, you know... The six-sided quadrilateral. These are not coincidences. And the, re the way that Saturn generates form is that it forces things to manifest physically. So it forces you to participate in a physical existence. And when Saturn contacts something in your natal chart, in your astrological natal chart, like your sun, for instance, in very close conjunction, then it forces whatever it contacts to be limited. It does not allow, for instance, the sun is an energy source, so its main impulse is to, to shine, to announce itself, to, to be out there. It represents the ability to focus, the ability to objectify, the ability to, to, to have access to a sense of I, an ego. And the only thing an ego really wants to do is to create. And the reference point for its creations is itself. Because what it is looking for is self-significance. The solar impulse is looking for self-significance. When it finds its self-significance, then it can truly become the energy source that it is. It can shine. It can broadcast itself. It can express itself. And the reward for doing that, for finding its true nature, the reward is joy, ecstasy. When Saturn contacts that, it denies that ability. Now, there are so many ways the sun is realized in astrological natal chart synthesis, you know. But more often than not, people realize themselves, realize their sun as an identity, and it stops there. You identify with yourself, you identify with your immediate surroundings, you identify with your brothers and sisters, your neighbors, your family, you identify with your friends, you, ident you know, you have an identity and you, you kind of have a sense of self. When Saturn contacts the sun, it strips away the ability to form intuitively this sense of self. So you don't know what your relationship is with anything. Friends, brothers, sisters, you don't even so because and because of that, you don't know who you are. And the reason why Saturn behaves like that, because what it the way it achieves this is by creating limitations, restrictions, blockages. So every time you have an objective tied to any of the ways you define yourself. You experience failure. The objective is unfulfilled. Because the objective is an extension of yourself. It's an extension of your ego. So when Saturn comes in contact with this, it blocks it. It doesn't allow the ego to find an expression. Now, depending on where this conjunction is taking place in the natal chart, the requirement of Saturn is implicit. And once that requirement is satisfied, then the Saturn basically dissolves, it, it disappears. You realize that it was never there. 
Now, the reason why Saturn creates these blockages and these difficulties and these hardships or restrictions is because it will not tolerate a sense of self that is non-physical. So it is pushing the native, the sun, to externalize the sense of self, to seek their self-significance in accomplishments which they believe they can earn, which they believe they have earned. And depending on where this conjunction is taking place, prescribes the size of the physical experience that must be achieved in order to be able to have access to the sense of self. So if you're someone like has a sun Saturn tight conjunction in in the tenth house, for instance, then the amount what is expected of you is so significant it literally affects the, the entire world. Such that you must make a name for yourself, you must make your mark, and it won't allow you any type of mundane existence in the sense. Now the way it does this, it constantly accuses you of insignificance, which is the opposite of what you're trying to achieve. It constantly criticizes you and accuses you of being mediocre, insignificant, unworthy of anything, an absolute buffoon. And yet, you are aware, because you are still aware of your son, even though you cannot externalize it yet, because you haven't met the Saturnian criteria. You are aware of that son, so you are aware of a potential difference between what Saturn accuses you of and what you know you really are. And that potential difference is a source of tremendous resourcefulness and creativity. Because you're always looking for a way out. Now, the reason for this type of configuration is, is one of the ways in which the, the sixes realize outcomes. Deny you of something and then put the, the inability to accept that status quo within the same individual. And so the individual rails against their restrictions. It torments them day and night. And they keep looking for a way to outdo, to overcome those restrictions. Now, that's the whole point. It's an engine. It's a dynamic. So duality is the way that we experience reality because of the Saturnian influence. And if you haven't understood that, then that's because you're, looking, you're reading Genesis 3 differently. The serpent that came to tempt Eve. There was no serpent. There was no Eve. There was nothing. But out of nowhere, an alternate viewpoint arises in your mind. That's duality. You d develop the ability to see things from two opposite points of view. That's the measure of self-awareness. And the reason why Saturn, why this thing is called Saturnian or why it arranges all these things is because that is the nature of physical reality. So if you're going to achieve something in physical reality, then this is the way. If you're going to achieve something tangible, something of great depth and value, this is the way. Now, but there is a corruption of this process because the whole point of this is not to punish you. It's to deepen you in such a way that you can achieve this physical making of your mark so that your self-significance comes from something that is physical, tangible, an achievement, an external achievement of some kind, you know, external, so to speak. But the corruption of this process is what has been called Satan. It is satanic means a corruption of the processes of Saturn, which is to implement Saturnian forces for no good whatsoever, just for the purposes of wickedness. And it is in that way that the entire fabric of white supremacy is satanic. And you can you can be sure you can you can check it. The end product of white supremacy. It's the outcome that it tries to enforce is anti-black racism. That's black inferiority. And it achieves this by feeling white supremacy. Not just in words or whatever. In actions, in behaviors, in objectives. And it is not doing this for any good. It is doing it purely from a place of weakness and jealousy. And these are terrible, bad motives and it is in that system the white supremacy is a wicked system. And it is what? It is anti-nature. Because you can see white supremacy and Christianity, they share, the, they share similar qualities. Because one came from the other. Just as Christianity weaponized itself against blackness, it created white supremacy, which weaponized itself against all instantiations of black, especially black-skinned people. That's exactly what it is. You see? And wickedness is ignorance regarding the sixes. That's what it is. And its behavior type, the type of behavior that it represents, is to unbalance nature, to unbalance the sixes, to unbalance the behavior of the universal pipe piper, 
to unbalance everything, to desynchronize it. And since these see, these sixes and the behaviors of the Pied Piper and all the universal melody that it plays, the triple sixes, that's what sustains life. That's what life is and that's what sustains it. But because of this desynchronization, delinking and deconnecting, de disconnecting rather, then death begins to proliferate. If you think I'm, I'm, if you think all of this is made up, go look at your Christianity. The symbol for Christianity is a dying man on a on a piece of wood, and that's what for, that's what is held first and foremost everywhere you have Christianity. It's the image of a dying man on a cross on a on a, on a, on, a, on, a, on a wooden tree. Why, why is this so hard for you to see? If you venerate death, then you create death everywhere. And the reason why it does that is because it is anti the sixes, it is anti life, it is anti blackness, and so it must be pro death. These are not coincidences. This is the structure of the reality that we live in, and they're all tied together to the particle masses, to, the, to everything. Even though you need a whole new podcast to understand how the sixes conspire to create human behavior, but that's exactly what it is. So, the first processes in the correction of all of this is that the sixes, the triple sixes, begin to come out of the, the demonization process because they tie into the nature of scientific truth. Now, from the nature of scientific truth, which they basically open up and everyone begins to see the truth for themselves, I mean, science is based on what? Then it begins to come out of that abyss of that prison, of that jail, of that dehumanization. And because of that, the entire archetypes within your human mind, within human behavior, they all begin to get transformed. And the critical mass of that is what transforms the entire world. A world where blackness is exalted by virtue of what it is, life. That's it. The processes of life are celebrated. They are honored. And all the complex systems that sustain and maintain life, they are celebrated, honored, because within them contains the wisdom of the Pied Piper. That's really what it is. So we know that from the world, for the world to go from where it is now to where it is invariably, inevitably going to go, you can just begin to imagine the type of changes that will take place on planet Earth in human behavior. Look at what the world is now. And think of the exact opposite and plot it um, a map from how to get from where it is now to its exact opposite then you understand the type of changes that are going to take place on earth they are just spelt out the next developmental cycles that will take place between now and when this inevitability occurs that's really what it is think about it